Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of KISS Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. I've got some exciting news to share. I've finally been able to release two white papers that are now available to read and download on our website. The first one looks at a comparison of living soil methodologies in relation to plant health and yield in a controlled environment for cannabis. In this trial, three different living soil recipes were tested and then put under fluence lighting in a controlled room and yield was documented. The other white paper looks at a cost analysis of living soil cultivation at different yields in comparison to the cost of more conventional methods like bottled nutrients or hydroponics. Would love to get some feedback from growers on these white papers and hope people will go on the website and check it out. Just go to our front page, click on blog, and it's the first two articles on there. I'm hoping this will spark more discussion and research into this methodology as a viable way of cultivating cannabis in controlled environments and also get some growers to attempt similar experiments to replicate the results. Now on to the podcast. My guest this week is Sarah Pelkofer. Sarah grew up in a small town in Northern California in the olive growing capital of the U.S. She got her B.A. in Environmental Studies from UC Santa Barbara and worked for years for a private environmental consulting firm writing environmental impact reports and statements and creating remediation plans for Superfund sites. She then moved over to Switzerland to get a master's degree from the Department of Evolutionary Biology and Environmental Studies at the University of Zurich, studying and publishing work on the importance of urban gardens as habitat for solitary nesting bees and wasps, while starting a microbrewery to pay for her tuition. After she completed her PhD in plant science and policy at the University of Zurich, studying plant-soil interactions and publishing her own work on soil biodiversity and the stability of ecosystem functioning. During her PhD, she was lucky enough to be able to travel around the world to share the results of her years of research with other researchers and scientists. Sarah wanted to bring this knowledge about the crucial state of soil biodiversity to the public, so she left academia and started the company Microculture in Seattle in 2015, under which she designed the microbial inoculant plant probiotics with the motivation to empower all levels of gardeners to easily start to bring their own soil back to life. Now on to the podcast. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about your background. You have a really interesting um, academic background relating to everything from evolutionary biology to environmental studies. Can you just tell me a little bit about, about yourself here to start off the podcast? Well, it took me a while to find my direction um, after I I grew up in Northern California in a, in a small farming town. And when I finally went to school, I had no idea what direction I wanted to go. Um, but eventually I was kind of, it just went towards environmental science because I found that there was just, uh, you, you, we were just seeing so many problems in the world and it seemed like a good way to try and, you know, make an impact Um so I went into environmental science as an undergrad and I started, I was doing like a geography minor um, with an environmental science major. And um, from after I graduated with my undergraduate degree, I went into environmental consulting um, and started working on super fun sites and doing um, in- environmental impact reports for new construction sites. And it was, it was all pretty, um, it felt like a big downer because it was just, um, just a lot of degradation in the environment. And I decided that I didn't feel like I was making a big enough impact. So I wanted to go back to school again. And I found a great um, in evolutionary biology program at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And who doesn't want to live in Switzerland? So I decided to go there and started studying um, wild bees and wasps in urban environments. And so we were looking at how... Um, how these they had these these kind of urban gardens there um, they're like little plots of land that you can rent and you have your own little garden in the middle of the city and I was studying how how important these these gardens were for um, acting as a habitat for for bees and wasps and it was pretty cool because we found that these little tiny gardens that didn't seem to have they weren't actually like a ton of space they were very very small like completely surrounded with you know high-rise buildings. Um, they were actually acting as a really important habitat for, 
for bees and wasps, and they had even more diversity in them of different species than than um, were out in in agricultural areas. So it was a pretty like impactful study in terms of um, talking to the city and telling them to kind of preserve these spaces. Uh, but after that, I mean, I was spending a lot of time in in the garden um, in these gardens, and I was looking at also how the diversity of bees and wasps was also related to the diversity of what was in the garden. Um, so I was looking at a lot of plant stuff. And and as, as my master's degree finished, um, I got the opportunity to stay to do a PhD and decided to, to stay for that and um, ended up studying soil biodiversity underground and how that was related to biodiversity above ground. And um, so with my work, I was looking at how soil biodiversity affects how plants grow and how they function. And so we were looking at, um, you know, when, when I say functioning of an ecosystem, we're talking about um, the carbon sequestration, uh, nutrient cycling, um, how, like, how well the, um, the plants are able to grow, like biomass production and um, decomposition and so, like several different functions, like basically trying to look at the functionality of the system as a whole, and we called it multifunctionality. And um, we are finding that the more diversity that you had living in the soil, the more diverse, um, or excuse me, the more, um, the better functioning the, the above ground system had. And we also, the, the more novel part of, of my studies um, was that we looked at the stability of that ecosystem functioning. And so um, we were able to find that systems that had more soil biodiversity actually had a greater stability in the ecosystem functioning. And so it was kind of like a really, um, like it was, it was really like it, it, it backed up previous work showing that, that there is this relationship between biodiversity and the functioning of a system, but it also found that the biodiversity is, is great for stability and it really, kind of gave like a good a good background for for saying that we need to preserve soil biodiversity and it's and it's it is really important for not just you know the underground but the above ground systems um so after like finding all of that stuff out and you know my phd was coming to a close i had to figure out do i want to stay in academia um and you know keep spreading the word in academia and keep building on this research about soil biodiversity or do I want to go some other direction? And I decided that it, I, I felt like with my results, it seems you know obvious within the academic community that this was the way things work, but it didn't wasn't really translated into the public eye. And I figured that um, you know soil biodiversity it, it needs to be preserved, but there it wasn't really um, like there was it just needed to be told to the people somehow in a better way because scientists and um, the public just they kind of have this lack of communication sometimes. So I decided to start a business uh, called Microculture, and I make um, a microbial inoculant that kind of gives people an easy way to bring their soil back to life and improve their soil biodiversity in their backyard. Um, and so it was a major change of hats uh, going from academia into the public sector, but that's kind of a general story of how I got there. You know? No, that's great. I, it's wonderful that you're local too. I've had the opportunity to meet with you in person, which was a lot of fun. And I know we've talked off air about quite a bit of stuff. And uh, you really impressed me with your knowledge. Uh, there's so many of these microbial based products on the market now as the industry is realizing the importance of microbes and um, this this concept of pro plant probiotics that you're hearing more and more. So I, I really enjoy uh, I really enjoy that. I can you tell me a little bit more before we get into this uh, concept of biodiversity? Cause I have some thoughts on that. Can you tell me a little bit more about what is in your uh, plant probi probiotics product? Well, we have, um, when I say we, it's, it's me, <laughs> but I always talk in the, the, the we sense, but um, I have a mixture of, diff of three different kinds of bacteria and four different kinds of listed fungi that they're the bacteria are all um, they're bacillus species and the fungi are gloma species and i i came up with this formula um because i wanted to make the product um kind of universally applicable to different gardens and different growing environments and these are species that um, i studied in in my graduate work and they always seem to be present in healthy really healthy systems and they're they're naturally occurring species if you have a healthy 
natural soil. Like if you go out, um, you know, into any grasslands or forest, you're going to find these species there. But they are the species that tend to be lacking in, um, you know, the soils that we process a lot, bag soils. Um, it, yeah, if you basically, if you're adding a lot of fertilizer and chemicals to your, your soil, you're going to be pretty efficiently killing these guys off. Um, but they are the ones that, that really help uh, the plants, you know, they, they really uh, form a symbiotic relationship with the roots of the plants. Um, so I have these different species in, in the mixture, um, along with a few starter nutrients of kelp, amino, and humic acid. And those guys are there to kind of help the kickstart the, the, the bacteria and fungi once they're activated because the, the product is in a powder form. It's a dry powder form. And so um, they're in this suspended state. And then when you add water to the system, they're activated. And then this kelp and amino acid, amino and humic acids come in and kind of give them some food to start out with before they are able to seek out um, the plant roots and pair up with them. Yeah. Now I found out about you from uh, Stephanie down at Fire Cannabis in Oregon. She's been using your product and uh, she's a good friend. I love what she's doing down there. She's an amazing person. Um, have to give her a, a shout out and some credit. And uh, so that's sort of how I found out. And then I realized you were local and you and I had some uh, conversations offline and you gave me a sample, which I, I threw under the microscope and tested. Um, the problem with these, a lot of these, uh, like you said, suspended microbial products is they're not uh, motile bacteria, so they're not very exciting under the microscope. But I did see an increase in bacterial biomass over time uh, when I added distilled water and a food source. So I don't, knew there was something alive in there. It just wasn't a lot of f fun to look at under the microscope like some of the more um, exciting uh, things like the fungal hyphae and flagellates and, and motile bacteria. But um, yeah, that was, that was great. Um, so basically what you did was you took your background in academia and looked at the specific species that you had researched or found, uh, to be most effective and then, and then put them into this product essentially is what, is what I'm getting. Yeah. And I was also, I think, um, I was kind of funneled as well by, by the market and availability of different laboratories, reliable laboratories in the United States. Um, cause I wanted to have a solid source. I mean, there there are tons of suppliers out there that can, they say they can give you whatever species you want essentially, but um, a lot of them are overseas and it just is, is, yeah, I, I didn't have a lot of faith in, in, um, in the, the viability of the species that we would be getting. So yeah. And, and I didn't want to like overrun the system as well with um, too many species. So this is just kind of a good start um, for, for the mixture that I have right now. Yeah, I know you're looking to branch out, and you and I talked about some other microbes that you were excited about uh, hopefully getting into a commercial production uh, with your products down the road, which I love that you're open to that and it's constantly evolving. Uh, one other thing, though, you had mentioned um, off air that you do some testing back with your old university on the viability of your product on a, on a fairly uh, regular basis to make sure that it, you are providing the uh, microbial levels that you're claiming on the product. Yeah. So I, I sent some samples back to um, Switzerland and I, luckily I have um, my old colleagues. A lot of them are on my scientific advisory board with microculture. So I, I get to banter back with, and forth with them about ideas and just kind of like they, they have better access to the current state of the science. And so as things are evolving and we're discovering new things, which we are all the time um, because, you know, science is, or excuse me, soil is, is really like the great frontier. We know so little about it. So it's, it's great to have them there, like with their hand in academia and being able to have access to the journals and all of the current science. And um, so I sent samples back to them and they've incorporated them into some greenhouse experiments. And then they also have, um, you know, the DNA extraction uh, laboratory and equipment um, to do that. But I also... Um, have contract or I have uh, samples going out to some local labs here in um, the Pacific Northwest and they're doing the fungal spore analysis for me and I think it's really important to kind of just constantly keep testing your product um, because it's just it's a really challenging 
um, medium because we can't see we can't see the species. It's really hard to have quality control visibly, and so you have to you know send stuff out and you have to pay for it. Um, but I think it's important to have have these um, to be able to know that you have the viability that is listed on your product, and at least at the minimum concentrations that are that are um, on the package. So it's 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 yeah, it's money out of your pocket, but I think um, in the end you're going to have a better product that's more reliable, that's going to give more reliable results to um, your clients, and so I think it's totally worth it. Yeah, one thing that a lot of uh, growers don't realize is that with microbial-based products, you, I believe you have to submit an initial test that shows the concentrations to support what you're putting on your label. But beyond that, there's, there's very limited testing done by the state to actually ensure that the levels that you're claiming on the package are really in the bag. And then you don't know how long it's been sitting on a shelf, um, how it's been stored by whatever company is distributing or selling that product. And it gets really, really uh, convoluted, I would say. Um, the only state that I know that's actually done any of this testing is the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Uh, so I suggest if you haven't signed up for their uh, fertilizer and pesticide alerts, it's something that everyone should go do. It's just a free email service that they provide. You just give them your email. And there they did a, a study or some testing back in, I want to say 2015 or 16, and they found that the levels were quite different based on what the claims were on the bag. So just something for people to be aware of when they're looking at comparing microbial-based products. Yeah, I think it's important that there is that there should be, um, you know, kind of a shelf life listed uh, on the product because it's I think that's just that's safe for the the producer and for the consumer um, because yeah then because microbes they want to grow I mean fungi and bacteria they want to grow if they get any access to sugars or if it's a suspended form like what I have in a dry powder form if it gets access to any kind of moisture they're they're going to grow and things are going to change and I mean that's the beauty of of um, of fungi and bacteria is it's they're constantly changing evolving um, but I think if you're going to be selling a product with you know X number of species listed at X concentrations, you have to be able to kind of stand behind that. So, yeah, I want to I want to kind of change directions here now. You you had mentioned biodiversity uh, early on in our conversation and how that was one of the findings that you had in your um, in your university study. And I haven't actually talked to you about this yet, but I recently went to Chicago for Photo X, which is a uh, a conference put on by Fluence Bioengineering. It's it's a lot of fun and uh, a lot of really good studies are presented there. And I hope to share some of that later on. But uh, interestingly enough, I'm sitting in uh, on the plane and this guy next to me is reading a journal article on how how earthworms can be used to in uh, soil remediation, this particular earthworm species. And so I leaned over to him and asked him if he was a soil scientist. And sure enough, I got I got seated probably next to the only soil scientist on the plane, uh, which was which was wonderful. So uh, he's he was a, a German professor who looked at uh, they they were measuring um, in a given amount of soil. They would find they may have twenty different species of earthworms and a certain amount you know a certain concentration of those earthworms and they were able to use that data for a given area to to see as an early indicator of the quality of that soil or so to be able to address um, soil problems before they got uh, too bad so essentially using the earthworm as an early indicator species which was I thought really interesting and then he was taking that and he said that um they were they found some farmers were taking earthworm castings or cores or that have actual you know viable earthworm species in it and then planting them into fields that were degraded that didn't have good biodiversity and these cores they were able to move um, I believe it was three meters per year and so you'd end up with this like circular patch around that core and there's a company doring this now in Germany and, and coring these fields and you'd see much healthier plants, biodiversity, all of these benefits uh, from this application. So that was just something I wanted to share that happened uh, happened to me this weekend. 
But then when I got to this conference, uh, it was very different because one of the things I found with university professors is they want everything to be controlled. You know, if they want to run a study, they want to control every variable. And the challenge there is when you look at organics and, and what we've talked about with biodiversity, you really, you really can't. So the, a lot of the studies, they, they're, a lot of the studies with organics um, may add too much, too much variability. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, are on that, but it seemed it was difficult to get the academic people there to talk about organics or to, or to look at organics just because of the complexity of the ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one of like the hardest things of working in ecology is you're you're working with these living systems that have, I mean, ecology is like the it's the interlinking of all of these these different things, and there's just effects from the the light, the the air, and the like all the different gases, the water, you know, it's just all these different effects, and I think it's it's yeah, it's it's incredibly difficult to isolate you know the variables of of you know what what is actually having an effect and. I mean, it's it's funny because with my PhD work, I had access to these incredible systems. We called them ecotubes, and it really looked like it, it did not look like a natural system at all. But it was the best shot we had at trying to figure out the true effect of soil biodiversity. And so these ecotubes were designed by my um, my well, in German it's called Doctor Father. It's a, my PhD advisor uh, Marcel van der Heiden, and they are these systems that they're these it's these like, kind of cylinders with these clear plexiglass glass tops um, and all of the air in the water going into the system was filtered. And so we would, we would only add, it was, it was of the entire soil medium, only 5% was our treatment. Um, so most of the soil was actually sterilized, uh, but we would add in a 5% inoculant of um, the soil biodiversity that we were testing. And so um, with, with all the air and the water um, being filtered, going in and, Trying to be, we basically eliminated the outside contamination of, of different microbes that were living in the greenhouse already. We that was a um, I would say probably like one of the best systems that I've seen for for trying to isolate soil biodiversity. And of course, it's artificial, and there's you know some some negatives from from having such an artificial system. But um, yeah, I think that kind of really what you're saying just nails nails the difficulty of of testing organic systems because. To, to have an or you know to really test an organic system you have to kind of make a a non natural system to, to do it so it's it's incredibly difficult to isolate the effects and and seeing like what's really causing the differences in your system is it you know it's yeah it's it's incredibly challenging yeah I would also say it it may limit the amount of academic interest in studying uh, some of these organic concepts too because it's so much harder to draw any sort of trends or conclusions from the research. And it's a, there's a lot more uh, challenges uh, like we discussed. So I, I guess my big takeaway was that uh, it still felt like at this, uh, at this conference that more and more people are pushing for um, more conventional agricultural, uh, I guess, processes or, or applications but hopefully we can take some of that data and then apply it back into organics. So, so take some of the things that we're learning regarding lighting and uh, nutrition and then find organic ways to replicate or, or use that information that they're, that they're, that they're doing. So uh, along that note, you had sent me this uh, recent article in Wired. There's a lot of stuff that you're finding in the news. Uh, this came out on October 2nd. And I'll post these articles on the podcast page. Um, this particular one is called Farmers Can Now Buy Designer Microbes to Replace Fertilizer. Uh, would you want to talk a little bit about uh, what the findings in that article were? Yeah. Um, so it was this Berkeley biotech startup. Um, it was called Pivot. They're called Pivot Bio. And they, they launched um, the first and only nitrogen producing microbial treatment. For, for U.S. corn farmers. Um, so they're essentially trying to, you know, the nitrogen-fixing bacteria that you normally find in, like, legumes that, or the fungi and bacteria that pair up with legumes, um, they're trying to do it paired up with corn, which is just, it's unheard of. I mean, it's, it's incredible to, to think that we have the science to be able to do this. But they use, like, a bunch of gene editing tools 
um, to re- rewire the, the gene expression of, of these um, bacteria that they found that they found them in nature um, paired up to the, the roots of some, some corn. But normally what happens in these agricultural systems is when you, when you throw fertilizer onto the system, you basically shut off the responses of these um, these nitrogen fixing bacteria. Like they they basically get the sig- like the plant sends out the signal that it has enough um, nutrients coming in, and so the the bacteria doesn't get the signal to pair up with the root. But they've kind of um, switched the genes to to make these bacteria keep on pairing with with the plant even when there is fertilizer inputs. And so the the kind of idea of it is that. The farmer can keep adding fertilizer, but also have the benefits of the bacteria that are there, increasing the efficiency of the uptake of of the nitrogen. So it's yeah, it's it's crazy to think that we've we're already at a point where this is um, being put onto the market. It's pretty advanced. Yeah. Now, knowing uh, with your background, I guess, how much concern do you think there is for the for the addition of, you know, essentially these uh, gene edited microbes or even non-native microbes to various uh, soils in terms of their effect on biodiversity, it it appears from what I see that you just don't see a lot of microbial persistence, which is why uh, a lot of these are being applied over and over again. But what, what sort of findings have you seen along that, along those lines? Well, I think, you know, nature is going to sort out the populations itself. You know, if these guys don't, if they're not fitting into the niche space of a particular environment. They're, they're just not going to be able to survive there, and other bacteria are going to be able to outcompete them. Um, but, it, yeah, so it's, it's – I don't know, like, what kind of guarantee this company is going to give for the viability um, of, of this kind of application. And if, they, if they're if they expecting people to probably have to reapply every year, I, I'm not sure. But I think it's – I don't think they can give any kind of guarantee of, of the effectiveness of this kind of product. Um, because everyone's system is different and they're going to have a completely different soil microbial community underground um, that is going, they're going to, the species that are living there are going to determine, you know, whether or not this one survives. So yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting to see like how, how this all works out. And, and I mean, it's terrible to think that, you know, when you put these, you know, gene edited species into the ground, you're kind of, um, I don't know. It's it's a little too hand like human hand heavy in in my opinion. I think there's probably should be more tests done. But um, yeah, I, you 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 think of like the worst case is you're kind of growing a monster, and if it somehow um, if it's, you know, this species really like takes off, it could take over and kill off native species. Um, and I think we just don't understand soil biodiversity enough to to really be messing with it <laughs> so much. I, I, well, yeah, we'll see where it goes, I guess. We'll see what happens. So we may be playing God in a sense and releasing essentially a lion in a petting zoo, um, <laughs> potentially. I, you know, I had an interesting conversation with this German professor on the plane about this, and uh, I was asking him about, you know, essentially the exact same question I asked you. And he gave me a response, and I was like, well, you know, you study earthworms. Earthworms are not native to North America, but they have a ton of benefits and we're all glad they're here. And he said, well, his colleagues in Canada, actually, there are certain species of plants that require a mulch, a heavy mulch layer. And the earthworms are breaking it down too quickly, causing uh, these particular plants to really suffer and potentially uh, go extinct. So, wow. you know, something that I think I've always thought of as a positive addition to our soils when we talk about worms uh, does have... Uh, non-target organism effects that may or may not be beneficial. So it, it's something to think about. Yeah, and actually um, some some work of my colleagues in Switzerland, um, and they, they found that, that some of the the biggest differences in, in the effects on the above-ground community um, of soil biodiversity, when they looked at the, the soil community, they found that the, those, the systems that did the best actually had um, populations of more rare species in them. So they're thinking that maybe um, the reason that these systems did better with the higher biodiversity was actually more of an effect of the rare species in the system. So I think, you know, maybe these rare species is 
there's something that we need to focus on preserving more um, rather than just finding one species that does X really well. And so we add a bunch of that. Um, it's like you need to kind of focus on the entire community, not not just individuals. Yes. And one difference I would do want to point out between, you know, your product and, you know, this particular study is that your product contains uh, bacteria and, fun- and fungi that are already found essentially worldwide. They're, they're native to, I think, all soils, as far as I know. Uh, yeah, that's exactly. Okay. I just wanted to point that out for people because <laughs> I want to make sure that we're, we're distinguishing uh, the two. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let, I wanted to move on to the, There was one other study I wanted to talk about with you that Stephanie actually sent over. And this one I thought was really fascinating. It came out on July 26th, this article out of the University of California, Berkeley, uh, entitled Fertilizer Destroys Plants Microbiome's Ability to Protect Against Disease. Um, I know she sent it to you as well. Did, did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, this is a really interesting study. Um, yeah, they found that, that um, when, you, when you add fertilizer to the system before, um, before they, they threw in a, it was a pseudomonas species that, that causes some kind of blight in the tomatoes. Um, before applying that pseudomonas, they, they applied fertilizer, and they found that um, this application of fertilizer uh, negated the protection of, that, the, that the biodiversity normally had for protecting the plant um, against the disease. And so, so when, when, the, when there was fertilizer applied um, and they, they put the pseudomonas on there, it completely took out the, the plant. And if they had biodiversity there, then um, the plant was, or they didn't have the fertilizer application before, then the microbiome was, a, was able to protect the system from the, the incoming pseudomonas. So yeah, it was, it was, it's a really interesting finding. Um, so, it, it, and yeah, I think it's, it's just the changing of the nutrients when you, when you throw in this fertilizer into the system, it really just throws off the balance of the microbiome and, um, and then I think also that when you throw on fertilizer, the plant is it gets the signal that it has enough nutrients, and so it doesn't send out the um, amino acids and signals to pair up with with more of the species underground. Um, and so then you're you you don't get the um, symbiotic pairing with with the good guys. And so when the bad guys come in, the system's open and free, and they're able to come in and just you know munch at the at their will on the plant. Yeah, one other really interesting result from this study was they found the best, uh, the most protective community of uh, of microbes was the lowest application dose as well. So the higher they applied the microbial community, the the less uh, plant resistance they got to the diseases that they were they were adding. Yeah, and and you initially look at that and you're like, okay, that's that's weird. <laughs> But um, if you think about it, there, they. So I looked at the details of this because that that was it just looked strange to me, and um, and I found that they they only um, applied twelve culturable species um, to the that that's what their microbiome was their their manipulated microbiome. Um, so it's only twelve species, but um, they only they did the testing. It was one week after the application, and so in my mind, if if you have more species that you're throwing in, it's going to take a lot longer than a week for everyone to kind of get situated and find their place. So, yeah, I think that you have species trying to, they're kind of all battling for nutrients and getting settled in their new space. And so, I don't know, I would like to see how those results would change if they tested later than one week after application. But yeah, I would, I, I don't know about the details of what exact species they were and, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to read more on it. So they, yeah, they took healthy tomatoes and then cultured 12 bacterial species that they found naturalized and, and thriving on these healthy tomatoes and then sprayed them onto new tomatoes. So just to kind of explain that to people and I'll, I'll post this article on the podcast page as well. So people can read it. Did you notice if if the 12 species came from the same location? I didn't. I didn't see that in there. Um, I, I just saw that they took them from healthy tomatoes. Yeah, and and so I was wondering if if maybe they were coming from different locations, which 
would then indicate they would probably even be battling more for the new space and it would just be like a rougher transition for that first week of the species together. But I don't, yeah, it's just another thought. Yeah, it's interesting because one of the claims that you hear out of the compost tea world, which is something I want to talk to you about next here, is that uh, foliar applications of compost tea provide aerobic or beneficial microorganisms directly on the leaf surface of the plant that will outcompete pathogens for that leaf space. Now, Mm -hmm. whether or not that is true, it's hard to say. I haven't seen enough actual research on it, and compost tea varies so much that it'd be really hard to draw any conclusions anyway, but it, it right. sort of goes in, well, in some ways opposition to this, but also in uh, support of the idea of having a, a healthy microbiome on your leaf surface. Yeah. I mean, it's called like preemptive colonization. It's like if the, you know, it's just there's, there's no space in the end. You know, if, if someone's living there and they're eating up all the resources, there's just not going to be any available for the new guy coming in. So it's just, it's harder for them to colonize. So I, I think it's it's definitely um, a valid valid argument. And also, I think we should be careful with foliar applications, knowing that we may be increasing uh, the opportunity opportunistic bacteria um, for for disease, I guess, on our on our leaves themselves. So mm-hmm. that would be the other conclusion I'd want to draw from that. But um, let's talk a little bit about you know, plant probiotics versus compost tea and some of these other products on the market, you know, they are, they are quite different. Can you, can you give us sort of an overview on your thoughts about, about these differences? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, compost tea is great. Like it's, it's, I, I think if you can compost tea, you should compost tea. And I'm not, we're not trying to replace compost tea, but I, I just think that everyone not everyone has the time, um, the resources, and the knowledge to make a really good compost tea. Um, as you know, it's, it takes a lot of trial and error to get like your t- compost tea right. And you have to have the right temperature, the right nutrients, the feeder. You have to figure out the right time for your environment. Um, it, it's always, you know, your, your starter species is, is it's dependent on what, what you have in there to start with. Um, so it's, it's a lot of, yeah, it takes a lot of uh, trial and error to get it like a really good compost tea going. So I made plant probiotics is an easier way to get a lot of the benefits that you get with a compost tea without having to, um, you know, have, have all that trial and error time and, and also without the mess. So it, it's especially good, I guess, if you're, you're in an apartment or something, you can't really do a compost tea, um, you know, in your kitchen. I mean, you could, but yeah, it's just not as, as convenient. So plant probiotics is kind of a convenient way to get a lot of the, species that you're trying to to grow in a good compost tea, but um, just have it in a more guaranteed and convenient form. And so, yeah, I, I think that if you can compost tea, you should do it. <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's, this is like the next best thing is, is a plant probiotics or, or of course, having your own compost would be even better. Yeah. I think when we're talking about this, we really have to compare, um, I'll look at all the pros and cons. So with compost tea or aerated compost tea, just to be specific here, um, it, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of cost associated with with having a good brewer. It's not as simple as just throwing an aquarium pump in in a bubbler in a bucket and then throwing in some compost in a food source. Uh, there actually is a, a fair bit of science that goes into designing and and using a, a good brewing system. And the other challenge with compost tea is, is variability. So we don't, we are never going to get the exact same brew. Uh, even if you use the exact same water source, compost source, brewing time, it, it's still going to vary quite a bit. And that's one of the challenges is that variability. There's also the risk of um, potentially having pathogens in, in the compost tea. Now, I, I think that's a fairly low risk due to um, if you're using high quality compost, um, there's, there's going to be a majority of beneficial microorganisms. Uh, and then the last thing along that lines is one advantage of compost tea is that we're getting functional nutrient cycling, which is something that you, you don't necessarily get with, um, these other microbial based products. Uh, that being said, um, you know, a, a microbial based product, uh, like, like yours may help increase nutrient cycling once in the soil. 
So uh, I know a lot of people have moved away from compost tea just because of that variability. But at the same time, there's so much that we just don't know about uh, soil plant interactions in the rhizosphere that people are, you know, even when people make a, a less than great compost tea, there a lot of times they're still seeing benefit. And, you know, you've, you've shown me results with your product where even if you have a pretty good soil, by adding, you know, plant probiotics, you're still seeing an increase in overall plant health. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, it, but I think the, your, the major point there is, is we don't really understand what's going on. And so it's, yeah, it's kind of better to give the system more options, um, you know, without doing too much, obviously, but, but letting it kind of sort out what it needs and just giving it, giving it a kind of a buffet option of, of, you know, what to eat. Yeah. And while we've talked about how we can't really control for every variable with organics and with these trials, what, what you could do is, you know, take a product like yours and apply it to a few of your plants in your garden and see how they respond versus the other plants. Um, you know, trying to eliminate as many variables as possible. And that would really be an easy way to determine a cost benefit analysis of, you know, adding a, a microbial product like this. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's, you can't look at your garden and say like, Oh, um, I'm, I'm missing uh, some glomus and geratices in there. You really, it's, it's just, you got to just do a guess and check um, and just do side by side pot experiments. That's definitely the best way to try and figure it out, figure out where you're missing your biodiversity, where's your gap. So what other things are you seeing here um, as you've started working with uh, gardeners and growers that are using, you know, your product or, or microbes as, as an additive into their gardens? What, what am I seeing? Yeah. What kind of, um, what kind of results are you seeing? Is there anything you've learned from um, now that you've had this company for a few years um, in terms of how, what sort of like responses people are getting? Do they vary quite a bit? Um, are you hearing back the same things from, from growers or gardeners? I've, I've gotten a lot of reviews from people that were just like, you saved a plant that was just totally on its way out. Um, and they, they tried, you know, adding different fertilizers and, they thought they had certain pest problems um, and they found that just adding the plant probiotics really just, it just made the plant stronger. Um, and people are finding, I mean, I, I have a guy who sends me pictures of his roses every year. Cause he's just like, these are the most beautiful roses I've ever had. And he's, he's like, just a, re a guy who's really into his roses. And so it's, it's cool. I mean, I, I didn't design the product for making roses more beautiful, but um, it's, it's a great byproduct of, of plant probiotics. So um, but yeah, people are finding they just have more robust uh, plant communities. They're able to resist disease better. They, they're able to survive through um, our crazy droughty summers now better. Um, and that's because, you know, when you have a fungal community that pairs up with the roots of the plants and it really is ex like reaching out and extending the root of the plant, that plant's going to be able to get to more of the water that is existing in the soil. So when you do water, it's, it's going to be more effective and more efficient. Um, and the plant's going to be able to better survive the, the, you know, the hotter, drier days. Um, but yeah, people, people, I've gotten a lot of positive reviews and some people have said, you know, it didn't really do anything for, for my plants. And maybe that's because they had a really great um, diversity in their soil already, or um, I, I think it's, it's really hard to say, you know, why, why exactly it, you know, it might not have shown positive effects on someone's system. Like maybe they, I don't know, maybe they, they applied it in a wrong way or something, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really hard to say, but it's a good first stab at, at trying to restore your biodiversity in your soil. Um, but I think we just started making a, a new shaker jar this year. And that's, it seems to go over really well with a lot of people because um, that's one thing I found is that people really like convenience. And the, so we have the shaker jar. It looks kind of like just a, a little spice jar. Um, and so you can take it and use it in house plants really easily and keep it under the sink and pull it out whenever your plant's looking a little sad and, and just sprinkle it on the soil surface and water it in and bam, you're done. And you don't have to go out to your shed and change out your soil. And um, it's just a really easy and convenient way to try and help your plants kind of in, in a more natural way than a lot of other things that you can do. So it's, 
yeah, I found people really like convenience and they seem to be pretty, pretty happy with their results in general. So that gets me thinking based on this research that we've already discussed, what do you think of for, uh, I guess, best practice around applications of microbial based products, whether it's compost tea or your product, um, in regards to, uh, fertilizer and other applications? Well, I think if you can get your soil community strong and robust and diverse, you're not going to need to, to add excess fertilizers. I mean, unless it's like a really closed system, then you'll probably have to, if you're not restoring it, if you're not restoring the nutrients in your system in any way, and you're taking stuff out of it constantly, you're probably going to have to restore it somehow. But in general, if you have um, a natural soil community that's strong and robust, the, the, the soil microbes are going to do the work for you. And you don't have to add all the synthetics and the terrible things that, that have become like the norm and mainstream that we're all tr- starting to realize are just, they're bad for, for the environment. They're bad for us, for our bodies. They're bad for the plant, essentially. They're bad for the soil community. Um, so we can kind of steer clear of those if we have our soil, um, our soil diverse and, and strong and healthy. Um, but I think, yeah, just, just try out different species, um, different mixes and see what works in your system, see what you're missing. Um, so yeah, if, from that respect, I would say, yeah, look for, to look for, um, like a diverse species list when you're trying something out and then just, yeah, see how your system responds. So what about adding, uh, additional micro mycorrhizal fungus at, you know, at say, for example, taking uh, your product and another myco product and adding them in at, you know, initial transplant, for example, or when, when cloning, have you seen anyone doing anything like that? Yeah, I think um, that's probably the most effective time to, to add the product because you're really like, you're, you're putting it in right at the root zone when you're planting. Um, and, and it's, it's more of like a, a, yeah, a basic system. So the, the fungi and the, the plant root are more likely to pair up. Um, but you're asking like, what's the difference between like, between two different, two different products or what, what, like, are you saying? Well, I know you have some Gloma species in your product uh-huh. and then there's other ones that are more, uh, that have higher spore counts that, but may not have that same diversity. Like for, um, for example, the ones that we currently sell are, uh, specifically rhizophagus interatices or glomus interatices um, because that is the most researched um, form of, of or species of mycorrhiza in regards to most of the plants that people are growing as I, I know mm-hmm. you already know this so I'm just <laughs> throwing it out there for listeners so adding a higher spore count say of the of that particular glomus species at the time of inoculation um, we could add in your product at the same time, I, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting at as a way of increasing the overall microbial community or microbiome. Yeah, totally. And I think, again, it's finding that, you know, that missing, missing piece in your, in your garden puzzle. Um, and because the, the system is going to self-regulate, like if it already has too much interatices, it can only support so many. So it's, it's going to balance it out. And I think, yeah, you can, you can add, a bunch of different stuff. And, and I don't know if the spore counts, it definitely matters uh, um, up to a certain point, but after that, I think it's just kind of maybe overkill. Um, Cause as long as you can guarantee the successful growth of, of spores, you know, certain base, base, um, baseline of spores, they're going to propagate. And so they're going to, um, they're going to fill up, fill up your community. You know, even if you start with a low number, if they have the resources there and the, the environment is right for them, they're going to bloom. Um, so you just need to have like a, I would say like a minimum, there's like a minimum viable number that, that you should have. But yeah, I, I don't think necessarily having a lot more is really going to make a huge difference in your system because if they can't support them, they'll just die off. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, um, ultimately all we really care about is that we're getting this mycorrhizal infection um, as quickly as possible when transplanting. Cause a lot of the people, you know, we're talking about a pretty high value crop here with cannabis and a pretty short growth cycle. So uh, getting that done as quickly as possible, but the r- research that we talked about today is showing that maybe um, higher amounts of microbes are not always necessarily better. So I, I think there's a lot more research to be done on this. So I, I think that's really interesting. 
So while I have you on the phone, is there anything else that you'd like to share in regards to the future of your company or, or the future of uh, sort of uh, microbiology and, you know, agriculture and horticulture in general that, you, that you're seeing? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think for, for plant probiotics, you got to just keep an eye on things because I, I have some, some ideas in the works of, you know, expanding, adding different products. Um, you know, targeting different plants specifically because we know that there are there are specific species that pair up better with certain plants, um, and so yeah, I'm trying to constantly evolve evolve the product. Um, maybe just go for a different you know having a line of products that that go for different different plants and different targets. Um, so keep an eye on that. But um, yeah, in terms of, I, I think. I think it was, was it Dave Montgomery who talks about like the fifth agricultural revolution um, that we're in right now. And I think, yeah, it, I think it's an exciting time. Like we, we are learning how to kind of give the power back to nature um, in, in our growing systems. And we're realizing that, you know, us interfering and adding, you know, all these synthetic, you know, fertilizers and pesticides is not really the way to go. Um, and so it's exciting to see like where we're going with, this kind of encouraging our soil biodiversity and um, letting nature do what it does best, which is grow plants. And, you know, it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting time. So um, it's good. We'll keep an eye out on things. And I'm, I'm really interested to see like where these, these uh, new biotech companies go with trying to um, isolate different genes and, and put them into um, the, the, agricultural systems. Yeah, I've been uh, seeing more and more stuff pop up on endophytic uh, fungi and bacteria. So uh, microorganisms that actually live within the plant, the plant itself or within in within the seed. And I think it's I think that might be the next big thing here in terms of biologicals and uh, plant growth. But uh, I'm it's sort of really, really new at this point. Um, I don't know if you've seen much research on that, but it's something that I'm, I, I think is really interesting. Yeah. I haven't read much on that. I'll, I'll send you an article when, uh, when we get off the phone. Okay. But, um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you coming on today. I, I think that answers all my questions and, uh, yeah. I look forward to, I guess, catching up with you, uh, here in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be on. Um, yeah, and no, I'll actually, I think, we have a delivery coming to your, your shop today <laughs> for some plant probiotics. So That was Sarah Pelkofer with Plant Probiotics. I've posted the links and information we discussed in this podcast right on the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the podcast menu at the top of the home screen. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter on our website right on the homepage and subscribe on your favorite listening platform so you can stay up to date with all the latest information and podcasts right when they come out. You can also view and download the new white papers and their results on our website blog page. And thank you for all the wonderful comments and reviews regarding the podcast. Sometimes I get frustrated or stressed trying to keep up with my regular work schedule and also produce this podcast, so I appreciate the positive reviews and comments. Thanks for listening.